All right, so this is a bit different, but I got a call from none other than, ta-da, Laura Catena, who runs one of the premier wineries in Argentina. And she's got this question that is burning a fire in you. And it is, what is a Grand Cru? So if you don't know her, Laura Catena is, not only are you a winemaker, but you're also a doctor. Yes, an emergency physician. <laughs> and, and you started something in Argentina to study more about winemaking in a scientific way. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Yes, I founded the Catena Institute of Wine in 1995, where we dedicate ourselves to studying the climate of high altitude Mendoza. We are farming at 3,000 to 5,000 feet elevation, extreme high altitude, and we have these incredible rocky alluvial soils. And uh, we are trying to understand exactly how to get the magic out of this place. Getting the magic out of a place is something that the French have kind of coined into a term, and they call it Grand Cru. Now, what does that mean to you? Yes, well, the, the Grand Cru concept is based on a particular little piece of land. Usually it's you know less than five hectares uh, or 10 acres, producing a wine that has a very specific flavor that's memorable, a wine that's age-worthy. There's lots of different characteristics. Uh, but this concept was born in the Middle Ages, in the 12th century. And this is how the Burgundian Grand Cru's were classified. But now these Grand Cru, which is basically, you know, great growth, great site. We call it Gran Parcera in Argentina. This concept um, mostly applies in France to many of the different regions, and it's a legally defined concept. So you have a couple of wines here today that challenge this idea of Grand Cru. The first wine we'll be tasting is technically a Cru, and that is Domaine Alain Chavis, Pumini Montrachet, Premier Cru, Les Folatières. The second wine is from a parcella, a vino de parcella, and that's Adriana Vineyard Whitestones, and this is your wine. Yeah. Okay, so this is crazy because this is Burgundy, a famous region that everybody knows Chardonnay, and this is Argentina, a region that's not really well known for Chardonnay. I'm gonna taste the Bur Burgundy first because you know how it goes. On the nose, it smells like, it's got ripe apple notes, but it also has this really great sort of pine needle thing that I always look for in Burgundy that I love, which is fantastic. All right, you want to give it a taste? Yes. Let's do it. Salud. So this is a premier cru site. That's what that little one ear cru means. And on the palate, this wine has really good acidity, but we know it's been in oak, so there's a little bit of that <sighs> and that mm -hmm. creaminess on the mid palate towards the finish. And that acidity carries through, and I think that's what makes these burgundies age-worthy. So, contender wine here. On the nose. Well, you know what's crazy about this wine? Is that the fruit smells are almost a little bit, where we had really ripe apples, yellow apples. These are more in the quince zone. And I think quince is like a more lean, like nobody goes out and is like, oh, I want to go eat a quince. That's not an easy to eat fruit. This kind of has this quince floral note. Floral. And, yeah, it's floral. floral. And then it's got almost these, like I said pine needle on the last one, so it's, I think of that as a good thing. Mm. It's pine needle, but it's more floral. It's almost like pine resiny. There's mm -hmm. a, a res, like a, like where you like where you got some pine nuts. Yeah, and and very mineral. And for mi sure. mineral for yeah. sure. So yeah. let's give this guy a taste. On the palate, like a big explosion of acidity mm. comes out of this wine, and if we were talking Chardonnay, it tastes different than the one from Burgundy. The Burgundy is actually almost a little heavier mm -hmm. on the back palate, whereas this one's lean all mm -hmm. the way through. Can you tell me about what makes 
this white stones accrue mm -hmm. in your in your terms? Yeah, well, so Chardonnay to make these kind of mineral wines that can age needs to come from a cool climate. And people think, oh, Argentina, South America must be warm. But actually, we're at very high altitude, almost 5,000 feet elevation, and we have these stony soils that um, add a little bit of sunlight, even if it's so cool, and create this very mineral because of the cool climate, high altitude, but also with a little bit of creaminess, uh, Chardonnay. And, you know, both these wines comes from a small parcel mm. in each one of these places that had a very, has a very distinctive soil and history. Awesome. So let's move on to the next wine. So I have another set of two wines in front of us. And these are also two Chardonnays, aren't they? Exactly, yes. What is it about these Chardonnays? Why are we tasting Chardonnay again? Yes, yes. <laughs> um, because we're tasting a, a Chablis, uh, with a, which is a, a Grand Cru. And Chablis is known for being super mineral, super angular, like a very sharp, you know, oyster white. And then the white bones that comes from this soil with a lot of calcium carbonate limestone also has the characteristic of being very mineral, almost herbal. And so these are wines with like a very sharp angle. So with this idea of a Grand Cru and this actually being a Grand Cru wine, it has maybe a uniqueness quality to it that is what makes it special. What am I looking, like what do you think I should be looking for in these wines? Yeah, so usually a Grand Cru site is a site that makes a wine that every year has a particular taste, something that you can recognize it with. And sometimes it's a little bit of an imperfection that makes it special, like the, the Frida Kahlo Unibrow. Without that Unibrow, it wouldn't be Frida Kahlo. And, you know, if you taste these wines, let's taste them and you'll see what I'm talking about. All right, our first wine is the Domaine Louis Moreau, Chablis Grand Cru Les Clos. And the second wine is Catena Zapata's Adriana Vineyard White Bones. Uh, Vineyard de Parcella. All right, I'm gonna give it a swirl and a sniff and a taste and all that stuff. On the nose, wow. You know, when I smell really good quality Chablis, I always get this note of passion fruit that comes through on the palate, on the nose. It's just like, mm, passion fruits. This one has it. It's got a funky cheesy note in it too, which I kind of like. Funky cheese, passion fruit, limes and lemons and all that kind of thing but there is a lemons. fruitiness that comes through a rich fruitiness that comes through on the nose all right let's give it a taste am i the only one who tastes wine so loudly <laughs> wow on the palate it smelled lean and green but then it fills your palate with this massive amount of wah texture and flavor yeah, and all that Absolutely. and it's actually acidity wise it's good but it's not oh, it's balanced yeah and maybe that's what makes this wine and ground crew all right white bones Salud. whoa this is like i just walked into a field in a desert and i'm surrounded by sage brush and flowers yes yes Sage. Oh my God! It's flowers, like it's rosemary, actually transforming mint, me there. Mint. Yeah, it's minty. It's herbal. Now I'm looking for fruit. I'm digging around for fruit, and I'm. I want to say there's something appley about it, like yellow sure. apple, like sliced yeah. yellow apple. Yeah. That somebody is doing sagebrush stuff <laughs> over in the corner. All right, let's give this a taste. Acidity is really high. Yeah. Yeah. And for a Chardonnay, I don't think most people would call this Chardonnay. It's a little more herbal than you're used to, and we don't really know why that is. We're studying it, and we've got all these crumbled calcium carbonate that looks like bones. That's why the name is White uh, Bones, and it has always very high acidity. We like to harvest it rather early to keep all these herbal characters. Um, and again, this is South America, cool climate. Wow, so there's Chardonnay, part two, and you had a couple of other wines, maybe some ones that we're more familiar with from Argentina. Let's see what Laura's prepared for us. We're moving into the red wines, bigger and bolder, but not too big and too bold. 
Uh, like taking a look at these wines here, we have three, two, three elegant white wines, but two of them are Pinot Noir, and one of them is Malbec. So the reason why I put the Malbec in this fight of Pinot Noir is that I think that many Grand Crus are known for their elegance, and just as much as you can have a really elegant Pinot Noir, and, and that is really the characteristic of the grape, I think that Malbec from a cool climate and certain soils also has this very special elegance. And that's why I wanted to taste one wine from Oregon, one wine from Burgundy, which is a Grand Cru from Claude de Vujol, and then one Malbec from Cool Climate Argentina that comes from what I would consider our Grand Cru version of Argentine wine, the Adriana Vineyard. All right, well, starting with the wine number one, this is Lingua Franca, the Plow Pinot Noir from Eola Amity Hills. And now I know a thing or two about Eola Amity. Uh, you know, this is a appellation within the Willamette Valley that produces some of the most coveted Oregon Pinot Noir. So let, I'll give it a sniffy sniff. Wow. So right away, huge explosion of fruit comes through, but floral fruit. So cranberries, raspberries, hibiscus, and uh, something herbaceous, almost like a tea, like a tea leaf. What do you get? Yeah, definitely some tea. I always yeah. get a little tea and good tea. tea. And you know, the interesting thing is that the winemaker is from Burgundy, Thomas. And the other winemaker, the owner, is Larry Stone. He's a very famous sommelier. All right, well, let's give it a taste. Mm. Very concentrated. Yeah, very concentrated. For an elegant wine, too, pretty yeah. big on the palate, yeah. with lots of uh, bitter tannin which makes me think yeah. this wine will age a fair amount Absolutely. of years. Absolutely, yes, definitely. <sighs> wine number two. Now this is Claude de Vougeot Grand Cru by Domaine Jean Griveaux. Yeah, All right. so, so this, this wine comes from Claude de Vougeot, which is one of the, the larger crews uh, in, in Burgundy. Uh, but this particular producer has a small parcel, and I think it's just so distinctive, Pinot Noir, so classic, you could recognize it blind any time. Well, thank goodness I'm not tasting it blind right now, but on the nose, if you're taking notes, you know what's interesting about this Pinot Noir? It has all the indicators of Pinot, which cranberry, a little bit of mushroom, definitely red cherry, but there's almost a spearmint mintiness. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. A on the leather. nose. Yeah. Leather. I feel like it'll get more leathery as it ages. Yeah. I see what you're talking about. There is this mintiness. It almost tickles the nose. Yeah, it tickles my nose for sure. All right, we'll give it a taste. This is a Grand Cru. Lots of tannin actually on this wine as well. More in the middle of the palate. And the, there's really a distinct texture on my palate, which is like mm -hmm. medium grit, <laughs> sandpaper. You know, when you're just trying to get a little bit off, but not like a whole lot. It's a medium grit. And I think some of that actually comes also from the acidity. I think, mm. you know, these wines are, are pretty high acid because yeah. of the cool climate. Yeah. Now, Claude de Vougeot has been around for a long time, hasn't it? Since the 12th century. And what does this word clo mean? So clo usually means that it's encircled by, you know, these little sort of uh, stone uh, fences. Uh, and it's a specific site, you know, in, the, in, in a way like what a crew is, uh, but the, the clo usually has, you know, some, some really well-defined border. All right. And the last wine is your wine, the Malbec, the Fortuna Ter Terre. Am I saying that right? Terre? Yeah, Fortuna Terre. It's actually in Latin. It means luck of the earth. Okay, luck of the earth and a Malbec wine. Yeah, and, and look at how much darker it is. It's a lot darker. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, because Malbec uh, has a lot of anthocyanins, which are the molecules that give color to wine. Yeah. I can see what you mean. When I typically look for a smell in Malbec, I'm always looking for the fruit. The first thing I look for is fruit, and maybe there's chocolatey notes in the wine, but this is much different. Mm. It has, it does have fruit. It's a little bit more brooding. But there's a lot of earthy notes to this yeah. wine. Yeah, it's got the leather and the mushrooms, what you were describing yeah. for the pinots. Yeah, the leather and, and uh, the mushroom. 
Yeah. And I guess that's what I mean by brooding is like we're hanging out with a room of leather and mushrooms. Yeah. And a green quality too that I almost described like tea leaf as well, but black tea. Yeah. And that's because of the cool climate. Yeah. All right. So it's it. It's not overripe ever, you know, in this particular parcel, you always get this refreshing, uh, you know, fruits. Uh, it is ripe, but it's not overripe and it's a little herbal, exactly. So when you were looking at this parcel and making these wines, when did you decide this is something that needs to be on its own and it's worth doing on its own? Well, you know, we planted this vineyard in the early 90s, and it wasn't until about, you know, 2004 or 5 that we started, you know, deciding that the flavor of each one of these little parcels was so different that we needed to separate them. And at first we were blending them together after making them separately, and then we said, we can't do this. We need to keep these flavors separate. And that's how we started with the Vinos de Parcela, which is our version of you know, Grand Cru or Permit Cru. What I think is so bizarre about this tasting is that if I think about this wine as an Argentina Malbec, I'm like, it doesn't fit the markers of Argentina Malbec in my expectation of what it should Mm. be. But when I think of it more like a Pinot Noir from Burgundy, it actually kind of works. And you know how people think of Pinot Noir as a light wine, but actually when you swallow in your mouth, it's actually even less tannic. The this is not are smoother. The tannins are smoother right? than both of these yeah. wines. Yeah. And, and, yeah, and that has to do with Malbec. It also has very high acidity, like the other two. Yeah, but you know, Malbec is a very smooth grape. It has a lot of color, which sometimes makes you think that it is going to be very tannic, but then it's incredibly smooth. And that's that's actually how you recognize a Malbec. It's it's great structure lushness but very smooth tannins. Interesting. So this is the Pinot Noir of Malbec yeah. in a lot yeah. in a lot of ways. Uh, it was really actually surprising to taste these three. I was kind of expecting the Chardonnay to sort of be like, all right, yeah, you guys can do that. But I wasn't expecting to taste a Malbec alongside Pinot Noir and be anywhere close to match. Right? I mean, the, the, the main thing that's different is the color, but in other respects, there's a lot of similarities, right? There are actually a surprising amount of similarities. The, yeah. the floral tea notes yeah. that come yeah. through on this wine, like you said, the yeah. leather. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and we, we use a lot of oak cluster, which is the same thing uh, you can do with Pinot Noir to maybe balance the leather and the earthy notes with the, with the fruits. And we love oak cluster. And, you can only do whole cluster when you have really smooth tannins because otherwise the wine tastes bitter. It's very hard to do with Cabernet Sauvignon, yeah. but you can do it with Malbec from some regions and with Pinot Noir. So Malbec also shares a lot of winemaking, um, you know, techniques with Pinot Noir because they both have these smooth tannins. That's it's really cool. Thanks for trying us out on this. I wouldn't have thought that this was a Malbec now that we've tasted it alongside Pinot Noir. So we got to finish this off. Um, and you said you brought three more wines, yes. Yes. which we're going to try. And we're going to see if Grand Cru can be found elsewhere. We got our last set of wines in front of us. What ties these three very different wines together in your mind? Yeah, so you know, if, if Pinot Noir was the elegant version of Grand Cru, this is the power version. It's all Cabernet blends. And it's not just one variety, like the other ones we had. This is a blend of varieties. And if I'm looking at these wines and knowing what I know, these wines essentially model stylistically after the master blenders, which we look to Bordeaux for that. And Bordeaux also has a classification Grand Cru Class A system as well that's regulated and has different levels in it. What, in your mind, is, you know, in that system, it's the producer that essentially becomes the Grand Cru. So of these wines, are, are essentially, are you saying these are the Grand Cru's of each producer? 
Well, it's usually a producer and a particular site, uh, but the sites tend to be bigger than the sites in Burgundy. And yes, you know, this, this is the expression, uh, the, the greatest expression of each one of these producers based on Cabernet Sauvignon. I think you just said it all. So starting with the first wine, we have Gratamaco. Gratamaco. Okay, I'm butchering it. No, you said it, you said it fine. Really? Gratamaco. I like it how you say it better. <laughs> this is a Bulgari Superiore. Now this wine is essentially a super Tuscan. It's coming from Tuscany, from an area within Tuscany that specializes in Cabernet blends. Now, I think it's got some of the local grape in there too. Yeah, it's got a little Sanchovese. So it's not only is it a representation of maybe a Bordeaux blend, but it also has a little bit of Italy. All right, let's give this guy a taste, a sniff and a taste. On the nose, whoa. This wine is super perfumed. While still being very dense <laughs> and extremely fruit forward with these like crazy notes of, it's raspberries, but it's a little bit of blackberries and then leather. And I always get clay pot as a, yeah. whenever, I, yeah, it smells wood. like, it smells earthy, but yeah. in like sort of a dry, dusty earth kind of a way. Mm -hmm. So I like your cedar clay pot. It's like, yeah. Ooh, cedar. Like um, an incense cedar. Good call. <laughs> All right. Cabernet is such a big wine. Not only does it have a front and a middle, it also has this really long finish yeah. that I think is what people really grab onto, grasp onto when they fall in love with Cabernet. But there is something distinctly Italian about this wine too, yeah. in that the tannins instead of being super structured, they are kind of grippy and uh, uh, they transition across my entire palate. It's got a nice acidity. And it has yeah. super high acidity, which I associate yeah. with Sangiovese, yeah. which is, is the grape in this wine. Yeah. So wine number two is one of your wines, mm -hmm. Nicolas Catena Zapata. This is the wine that is the man. Can you tell me a little bit about what is this wine? Yeah, so the wine is called Nicolas Cadena Zapata, which is my father's name, and he grew up with Bordeaux. That was his inspiration to make Argentine wines that could stand with the best of the world. And so he loves this blend, which is, you know, dominantly Cabernet Sauvignon, but it's got about 30% Malbec and also some Cabernet Franc. So the thing about this wine is, yes, we've got Cabernet, that's our precursor, but we've got Malbec. Yes. So it's a Cabernet Malbec blend. All right, on the nose. I so I keep noticing this brooding quality about Malbec with the, your wines, where it, they they still smell really youthful in the nose. Where I feel like I really need to dig in there to sniff it out. But I am getting blueberries, blackberries, mint, a little bit of leather. Yeah, for sure. Earthy notes. And but it's it's sweet fruit. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't it, it it smells very welcoming. Yeah, I mean there's a little bit of herbal from the cabernet, but the malbec is more sweet fruit, and and you really see that combination. And it's, yeah. When it ages though, it it really ages like an old Bordeaux, and I think that is one of the characteristics of Bordeaux blends is that when they age. They change. They, they, they change and they, and they get that kind of same sort of what we call tertiary aromas that the Bordeaux blends get. So more in that tobacco leather yeah. quality that you get yeah. with a nice aged Bordeaux. Well, let's give this guy yeah. a try. Do you ever just call this dad wine? <laughs> oh, the dad wine. Yeah. No, <laughs> actually, someone once called it the dad wine. <laughs> yeah. I, I would call it papa wine. Papa wine. <laughs> Uh, so, um, what's distinctive about this on the palate, it's dr definitely dry. Yeah. For as sweet and fruity as it smells, it's yeah. very dry wine. And the tannins come out, instead of all over the palate like it was on this last wine, they're really in the front. Mm -hmm. I really feel them in the front and the front middle yeah. of the wine. Mm -hmm. And they taste young. It does, mm -hmm. they, to me, these there's um, herbaceousness yeah. in the tannin that makes me think, Oh, this might be something we can age. Well, absolutely. And 
this is a 2017, and you know, I think many people think that one of the characteristics of a Grand Cru is that it should be able to age. And that comes from having enough acidity and enough tannin. And I think definitely these first two wines that we've had have that potential. If you were to put, uh, you know, how producers say this goes from this to this amount of time, how, how long would you age this wine? I feel comfortable with 100 years, but, you know, I won't be alive, so you can't go and get me if I was wrong. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, I like to drink these wines with five to ten years minimum. Mm. Although I know that most people drink them young, I, I prefer them, you know, I'd be drinking this in 2027. I, I um, agree with you. I don't yeah. think this wine is ready right now. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's, it's so turned in on the glass, yeah. even though there's a lot of fruit there, yeah. and then the tannin still tastes so young. Yeah, I think you're right. It needs more time. I'm, right now, I'm drinking the 2004, six. You want to give me a bottle? Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. I, I had the 2009 the other day. Shh. Very right. nice. <laughs> to be Laura would be great. So our last wine is Schaefer, and this is from Napa Valley Stags League District, and it's called 1.5. This is... I think this is Schaefer's top wine. Yeah. I don't uh, have the top, but one of the top. Yeah. <laughs> and this... Great producer, Schaefer. And this, instead of being a blend, is 100% Cabernet Sauvignon. Mm -hmm. But I think Napa Valley is one of those places that's all about cab. It's That's yeah. their thing. Yeah. Uh, it's a huge amount of the plantings are Cabernet. And having a single varietal wine became super important, I don't know, in the 60s and 70s, predominantly the 70s, in Napa Valley. So we're basically tasting... What is what is Napa Valley? Yeah. What is Schaefer's version of Napa Valley? And I always look at the color whenever I look at Schaefer's wines because they're near opaque uh, when I look at them. This and it's from Devin. Stag's Leap also. A yeah. very, very great appellation. Yeah, and, and Schaefer's one of the producers that's in the Stag's Leap district, one of the few. So on the nose of this wine, this is also a wine that I feel like we're tasting too young. Yeah. Because it's very turned in on the glass. Yeah. But the yeah. fruit flavors to me, where this one was more red fruited and sweet fruited, this one's more blackberry and yeah. black currant and dusty fruits. But they're also very sweet to me, too. It's a very sweet blackberry note. That's beautiful. And, and then I, I do get that mintiness, that herbaceousness yeah. that we get from Cabernet on this wine as well. And you know what I love about these three wines is that in neither of them is the oak predominant and you know we know all these wines have a, a decent amount of new oak mm -hmm. and it's so well integrated and I think that's really the characteristic of a producer doing a good job with a Grand Cru site because you could have the best site in the world and you can mess it up but to me these are examples of somebody that's really letting the the crew shine on this one on the palate, the tannins hit a different spot. I get them more in the middle back. And I get on the finish of this wine, I do taste a little bit of oak on the finish of this wine. It has this sort of baking spice, sweet sort of sweet cedar on the finish that I associate with oak aging, where I wasn't getting it as much mm. with the yeah, Nicolas Catena Zapata and yeah. the Grat de Maco. Um, but this one still has lots of fruit tannin that comes through on the front of the palate, similar to what yours did. Mm -hmm. But then I get that really r rich, robust tannin in the mid back palate. Mm -hmm. I wonder, I wonder how long your wine will age versus Schaefer's wine versus this Grata Maco. Like I wonder what the difference is. I wonder what I would do. I'd probably want to just sell her all three and see and find out for I myself. Think if we if we called Doug Schaefer, he'll. Uh He'll have some opinions. Have an opinion, and he'll invite us to dinner. Yeah, that might be a good nice idea. Maybe guy. he's got an old bottle. <laughs> so, Grand Cru. This idea of Grand Cru as being something that can be outside of France. Is it okay to use the word Grand Cru? Uh, where can you use it? What's okay to say if you're talking about wines from outside of France? What do you think? Well, I think that there's many words in one language that then become international, like the word restaurant, restaurant. It was a French word, and now we all use it. The word terroir, that means, you know, the, the soil in a place that gives 
a wine its distinctive aroma and taste. And that, the word terroir is the word we use for that in English, in French, in Spanish, in Italian. So I think Grand Cru is headed in that direction, uh, except I do agree with the French that you know, one should not be using it on labels, on boxes, because it is legislated in France. But I think, you know, Grand Cru as a, as a term that means, you know, the best of the best from this region or, or you know, the, the couple of best sites. I think it, it's the, the word that has come to mean that. The two words. <laughs> Thanks so much for sharing these wines with us and challenging us on this topic of Grand Cru. What would you call it if you were to come up with a word to describe great, great growth? Uh, does it need to be a French word? Can it be another word? I want to see your comments below if you've made it this far uh, because it's an interesting topic. Uh, thanks so much for sharing your wines uh, and some of your friends' wines as well. Thank you very much. Salud. Salud. <laughs>